Okay, this is chapter one, continuing with the introduction, part two. Please have a look at the readings, pages one through 30 in uh, chapter one of the course textbook. So what I'm going to talk about in this presentation is I'm going to first talk about something called exponential growth and what it is and give a little bit of a mathematical description of it, very simple mathematical description. Then I'll go on and connect that to the concepts of environmental sustainability and the definition of sustainable development. And then I'd like to just introduce you and in, to the ideas of quite a famous professor, Canadian professor. He's from the University of British Columbia, Professor Bill Rees. He's the inventor of the environmental footprint analysis. So I'll give you a couple of links to uh, some a couple of short but interesting videos from uh, Professor Reese. His ideas are quite radical, but they're actually uh, well supported uh, by science. Okay, so people use the term exponential growth all the time. You'll hear people throw that term around. It turns out that uh, energy use has been growing exponentially uh, over the past 100, 150 years. What does that term mean? Well, it turns out that a, a bank balance, so simple interest is an example of exponential growth. So this is something that you've probably all had some experience with. So if you put money in the bank at a fixed interest rate and you just let the balance ride, the balance will grow exponentially, assuming no withdrawals. So let's just work this through as a demonstration. So let's suppose you start with an initial amount, A0, and you have an interest rate R. Then after one year, let's suppose this interest rate was 2%, for example. You'd, take, you'd let it ride for one year, you'd take your amount and you'd multiply it by 1.02, and that would give you your amount after one year. And then the next year, if you let the balance ride, you'd get another 1.02, you get another 2%. This is just basic compound interest. After year three, you'd multiply it by another one plus R. And so the generalization of this after T years, T being a general number, that tells you how your, your balance grows. And that's an example of exponential growth. And I'll explain one of the interesting characteristics of this in a minute. So for example, how much would an investment of $100, if it earned 3.2%, how much would it be worth? So 3.2% per annum, how much would it be worth in 22 years? Now, I've sort of rigged this example, as you'll see in a moment. So we take our little formula here. A0 is $100. R is 0 0.032, because you have to move the decimal place over twice. Uh, so 1.032 raised to the power of 22, so 22 years, times 100. And I picked this so that it works out exactly, almost exactly to $200. So at an interest rate of 3.2%, your money, whatever balance you put in, will double every 22 years. The important point to note here is that doubling time of exponential growth is constant. So let's suppose you took your $200 now that you have after 22 years, and you let it ride for another 22 years. You just apply the formula again, 200, but this time, so this time 200 here, 1.032 raised to the 22, and you get $400. So you have a constant doubling time. Money doubles every 22 years. And if you have a constant percentage growth of something, it will double every uh, in a certain period, and that doubling time will be constant. And there's a nice little approximate formula in your book on page 18 that doubling time is 70 years divided by the percent growth rate. So in this case, 70 years divided by 3.2, it gives approximately uh, 22 years. So I've been talking about money. That's because we all have a everyday sort of experience with money. But why is it important to this course? Well, I've sort of been alluding to it that over the past century or so, we've been seeing exponential growth in world population and national and world uh, gross domestic products. That's the value of the goods and services that uh, the world and our nation produces. We'd be seeing exponential growth in the amount of resources, the amount of iron ore, the amount of gold being mined, that sort of thing. And I showed you that we've been seeing uh, exponential growth, so constant percentage growth in energy consumption. 
nationally and uh, across the world. So it turns out, as you might expect, that exponential growth is highly unsustainable. And there's an old Persian parable that I like to use to demonstrate this. It's a parable about the invention of chess. And so the story goes, a, one of the king's servants in, uh, in Persia uh, invented the game of chess, and the king was so uh, enjoying the game and so liked the game that he said, you know, what would the king ask the inventor, uh, what reward he would like uh, for inventing this such wonderful game? And the inventor says, oh, I don't really want much. I just want one grain of rice on, on the first day, two grains of rice on the second day, four grains of rice on the third day, so doubling, eight grains of rice on day four, and I want to fill the entire chessboard all the way up to the uh, 64th square. So a constant, so in 64 days, with a doubling time every day, that's all he wants. And the king sort of laughs and thinks, oh, what a meager reward for such an amazing game, no problem. But if you do the math, how many grains of, of rice are there on just the last square here? Just to give you some perspective. Well, you're, it's the two raised to the power of 63 because you're only doubling it 63 times to get to the 64th square. And I've used some fancy math software here to calculate this number. This turns out to be 9 times 10 to the 18. And if you work that out, that's a, you know, 3 kilometers by 3 kilometers by 3 kilometers. It's an enormous amount of rice. It's about 100 times the current world production. So it, just a ridiculous amount. And that's just on the 64th square. That's not on the total board. So what's the moral of the story? Well, it has to do with the illustration of the unsustainability of exponential growth. Doubling from square to square every day is exponential growth. It's a constant doubling time, doubling every day. It's analogous to uh, the doublings we've seen in uh, energy use every, say, 10 or 15 years. And it warns of the dangers of treating a large but finite resource as infinite. And eventually, your growth runs into the physical constraints of the earth. Exponential growth cannot continue indefinitely on a finite world. This points to something called the myth of continuous economic growth. And this point is frequently ignored by politicians and business people who are constantly demanding uh, constant economic growth. Even the Green Party talks about constant economic growth when, of course, if you're going to grow the way we've been growing and the fashion we've been growing in the last 100 years or so, it's highly unsustainable. It cannot, it just cannot continue forever. So this leads nicely to a bit of a discussion of the principles of sustainable development and sustainability. There's a famous uh, report called the Brundtland Report. This is after the chair of the committee. So in 1987, there was a UN, United Nations World Commission on Environmental Development, and they came up with this definition of sustainable development. So you'll see this. It's really quite a famous definition. It's So sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generation to meet their own needs. And here, what they're talking about in terms of needs, is they're fairly basic things. So food, shelter, water, access to uh, sanitation, water, electricity. I guess suppose it, now internet would be could be included in there. And so this concept of sustainable development, uh, it refers to moving towards an economic uh, system that does not deplete the sort of natural capital, the natural resources of the world does not degrade the environment. We don't want to degrade the environment for uh, future generations. We don't want to use up all, for example, all the iron ore in the world, compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Sustainable development is, is kind of an ideal. It's probably something that's going to be very hard to achieve. Well, it is something that's very hard to achieve. But it recognizes the, the finite limits of the earth, that we can't go on with those uh, exponential growth indefinitely. And it also recognizes the, the idea of 
uh, fairness to future generations that we don't want to use up all the uh, resources on the planet um, so future generations can meet their own needs. Now, this is probably an obvious statement, but you know, the current situation in the world, there's a really strong uh, link between uh, economic growth and environmental degradation. So historically, economic growth has translated into increased energy consumption and increased resource depletion. And this graph here, which is figure 12.12 from your textbook, it has energy uh, per capita, so energy per person. I don't know what the units are. It doesn't really matter. And this is gross domestic product per person. Remember, gross domestic product is the value of the goods and services that you produce, that each person produces in a year. And this is in U.S. dollars, uh, thousands of U.S. dollars here. And so you have uh, countries that don't produce much, don't use much. These would be poor countries. And then they, we have the rich countries up here that have uh, uh, produce a lot of goods and services but have very high energy use. And very high energy use, as you will learn in this course, is well, nowadays it's driven by fossil fuels largely, and uh, that translates into environmental degradation as well as uh, resource depletion. So I think this just repeats what I just said. So higher energy use associated with these higher economic outputs translates into environmental degradation, like we've been seeing climate change, the, the, the increase in the CO2 and methane concentrations. We're going to do a section on acid rain, where burning of coal produces sulfur dioxide and kills our northern lakes. If in Ontario, air pollution, even in a place like Ontario, where we think our air is clean, it, uh, there's about something of the order of eight or 9,000 premature deaths due to air pollution in, uh, in the province of Ontario. And that's estimated by the Ontario Medical Association. We have water pollution and, and uh, issues of disposing of waste, urban sprawl, deforestation, and we're losing uh, natural habitat and species loss at a rate that uh, rivals the great uh, geological extinctions. We're into what's called the fifth great, or the sorry, the sixth great extinction. Many scientists think we've entered a new geological epoch called the Anthropocene, where humans are starting to have a uh, such a large impact on on the planet. When you listen to the Bill Reese, you'll hear him talk about sort of the great challenge of this century, and the, the great challenge of this century is to decouple this link between economic growth and, and energy use and environmental degradation and possible paths. We will talk about some of these in this course would be a transition to renew more use of renewable energy, a low carbon economy, efficiency improvements. Although Bill Reese talks about the, some of the pitfalls of efficiency improvements and how that may not be completely the, uh, the path conservation. So using less and lifestyle changes that of course we're all uh, resisting tend to resist. Clearly, world economies are not sustainable. The current economic growth is based almost entirely on non-renewable energy and resources, so fossil fuels, and we're extracting uh, you know, the uh, base metals from the earth at a, an extraordinary rate. And there's only a finite amount. The U.S. economy, there's a graph of gross domestic product going from the 1930s uh, up to almost present. And the U.S. economy has grown by a factor of 16 and 85. I would argue powered almost entirely by cheap fossil fuels, which are not environmentally sustainable. And of course, while we have a lot of fossil fuels, uh, 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 no, they are finite as well. And so you've got to wonder if, if, if it continues at this 3.4%, you know, can't the gross domestic product in you know the 1930s was about of the order of 1 trillion dollars and then it's grown to almost 18 trillion dollars in the next 85 years it would have if we continue this we'll be producing the US will be producing 300 trillion dollars worth of stuff and a lot of that uh, well that's a lot of energy and a lot of resource extraction so clearly unsustainable So I guess the point I'm trying to get at is exponential growth will be stopped at some point by the physical limits. It's something you can hardly ever get politicians to say or to understand. 
uh, even the Green Party promotes this idea of uh, continuous economic growth. And in the business community, it, well, it's you just constantly hear that they want economic growth. The word sustainable is often widely misused. I I, I don't know, think the the I took this the Canadian Department of Finance used to have this in the mission statement. The idea was to promote long-term sustainable economic growth based on environmentally sound policies and practices. Well, yeah, okay, but this use of the term sustainable is kind of at odds at, with common sense because sustainable development as we just learned, can't really involve growth, at least not in the traditional mode. If it involves growth, then it involves using more energy and using more non-renewables resources. So we need to sort of change our ways. So later in this presentation, I'm going to uh, introduce, you, introduce you to some of the ideas of Bill Reese and point you to some of his videos. In those videos, he talks about something called the Living Planet Index. And so I just want to talk about that for a moment. This was one of my in the news items back in 2017, but now it's gotten a little old. So I've just sort of incorporated it into this presentation. In 2017, the World Wildlife uh, Federation put out the uh, Living Planet or World Wildlife Fund, I mean, put out the Living Planet Report. And it's interesting that the uh, this is from the Star, uh, and with a quote from David Miller. David Miller's our past mayor of, of Toronto. You might recall he's the, he was at the time the president and CEO of the World Wildlife Fund uh, Canada. And here's the quote: uh, "The Living Planet Report is more than just a wake-up call. Uh, we cannot continue to think that we can separate environment and economy without dire consequences for wildlife." habitat, and humanity. So what the Global Living Planet Index is, is it's a monitoring of almost 4,000 vertebrate species. So by vertebrate species, we're talking about these higher level animals that have backbones, vertebra, birds, mammals, fish, reptiles, and that. So they've monitored the populations starting in 1970. And since 1970 to the present time, the Living Planet Index, the population of these 3,700 species on average have declined about 58%. And there has been no sign of recovery. So this represents a 58% decline in the population of vertebrate species on the planet uh, with no sign of recovery except for a little brief uptick here which I associate with the 2008 economic crisis, and I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, so it's strong evidence that unsustainable economic growth is directly connected to less wildlife on the planet, something that's constantly denied by uh, uh, conservative politicians. So if you look at this, this decline, and then a small up blip in 2008 here where the some relief, uh, small relief for the uh, planet's wildlife and then an uh, inex inexorable decline again. If we compare that to, for example, the gross domestic product of the United States growing, 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 and a small blip downwards, uh, that demonstrates, or I'm suggesting uh, that there's a, uh, that this link is not coincidental. So the focus of this course is on energy, of course, and the environmental impacts of energy. But I just want to take this one slide and remind you that, you know, yes, we're using up non-renewable energy resources, fossil fuels, but other resources are also being depleted, other resources such as base metals. And this graph or this chart here, which is taken from Natural Resources Canada, shows the amount of iron ore, gold, nickel, silver, and uranium left in the world. So these are global reserves in, in millions of tons, megatons. And then over here is something called reserves divided by production. So if you take how many megatons of, of iron ore divided by your production rate, how many megatons per year, you end up with a number of years before uh, you use up all the iron ore. Well, it's not really quite that simple, but that's approximately what it's telling you. It's telling you we have at current production rates, we have 95 years of iron ore left. And we have 22 years of 
zinc cleft, for example. Now, let me just clarify that a little bit. It's not, it's actually not the way things completely work because as you would start to draw down the resource, economics play a role. As you, for example, as gold becomes more scarce, it becomes more economically viable to go after less and less uh, rich seams. So uh, as the price of gold goes up, gold mines that were weren't economically viable, become economically viable. Viable. So it doesn't necessarily mean that we have 14 years of gold and we're going to run out. In fact, that's not the case at all. It, it, but it, it is an indication of the finite nature of the, of the resource on the planet. And we got to keep in mind that if exponential growth continues, it will eventually exhaust materials for manufacturing. So this sustainability problem is not just the problem of energy, it's a problem of materials as well. It's hard to talk about sustainable development without talking about world population. Now, this is a little bit out of my specialty as a mechanical engineer. It's getting more into social science, but I'll talk about it very briefly as best I can. Clearly, sustainable development, if we want to be sustainable, it requires that we move to an economic, a socioeconomic condition that stops world population growth. And world population growth has been growing uh, for a very long time. Uh, and very rapidly since about the 1800s, I'll show in a minute. So our current population is about 7.8 billion, and we're growing at about 1.2% uh, or 80 million people a year. That's, uh, you know, more than double the population of Canada worldwide every year. And if you think about this, you know, think about the number of deaths from COVID-19. Currently stands around, I think, a little over a million, maybe 1.2 million. So the deaths from COVID-19 this year will, won't have a dent on the, the rise of world population. Canada has nearly uh, uh, zero growth. So that's what's called true growth. Uh, that's births minus deaths. We're growing by uh, immigration. But other places in the world, like Nigeria, is growing at uh, more than double the world rate, more than double this 1.2%. And in my lifetime, when I was a child, when I was about four or five years old, and I was first old enough to understand what global population was, the global population then was about, about 3 billion. So in my lifetime, it's more than doubled. So here now, again, I've got one of these landscape slides just to show the graph of human population. Now, you've probably seen this before. World population going back 500,000 years here you know, very small population, quite stable, stable, stable. And then around around uh, the 1800 mark, we had this explosion of population. So we, we, we live in amazingly unusual times. And so the question is, well, why? Why did population suddenly explode in the, uh, in the 1800s? Well, there's lots of reasons. I mean, if you think about it, there's been some incredible uh, medical advances decreases in infant mortality. We have the, you know, in the 1800s, the Louis Pasteur and the germ theory of disease. We didn't really understand, you know, the, the ideas of bacteria and, and uh, how to sanitize things. And so life expectancy has gone up uh, substantially, uh, which of course contributes to population growth. But I think you can also argue that fossil fuels have played a big role if you think about it, we could not feed 7.8 billion people on the planet without mechanized agriculture, without machines powered by fossil fuels to uh, plow the land, to seed the land, to uh, harvest the crops, and also to, uh, to extract fish from the sea at an enormous and dangerously unsustainable rate. In addition, you may not realize this, but fossil fuels are are used, they're feedstock, they're used to make fertilizers, particularly natural gas. Natural gas can be converted into a uh, fertilizer to increase the yields on fields. So this raises the issue of what is the Earth's carrying capacity for humans, and what is it in the absence of fossil fuels, which are finite, and one wonders if the, if the planet's population is in overshoot. You'll hear uh, Bill Reese talking about this videos that I'm going to point you to. So I just add these slides as a little bit of interest. Every 10 years, the United Nations has a 
uh, a meeting of the population division and they put out a report. This is the one from 2015, I believe. And it talks about, uh, you know, projections. The demographers get together and make projections for population growth. Right now, uh, the world population is estimated to, they think it'll peak at about 11 billion in uh, 2100. It's strongly linked to poverty rates. And as you can see in this graph, the population change my pointer. As you can see in this graph, the population projections here depend upon the fertility, how many children each woman has on the planet. And it turns out that educating women, you've probably heard this, reduces uh, fertility rates and could have an impact on uh, world population growth. If you go to that report, you'll find graphs like this, population, and these are projections going up to 2100. And the red line here is the, their, you know, their, their median projection, where I got that uh, 11 billion number from. But it could be affected by uh, these fertility rates. Okay, so this leads nicely into a discussion of the ideas of Dr. Bill Reese. Uh, Bill Reese is a professor at the University of British Columbia. He's a professor of ecology. And uh, he is the inventor of the what's sometimes called the environmental footprint or ecological footprint analysis. And he's going to explain this in some detail in the videos, which I think you'll find pretty interesting. But sort of by way of introduction, I'll just give you a quick overview. What your ecological footprint is, is the area of the earth needed to produce all your consumed goods, you know, everything you need, your food and your clothing, and to assimilate your wastes. And he's done an analysis of, uh, you know, various ranges of North American lifestyles. And he finds that the amount of land that you need to grow all your food and to produce all your, your, your consumer goods is about five to 10 hectares per person for the typical North American. And just so you know what a hectare is, a hectare is a hundred meters by a hundred meters. So that's a, a little bit bigger than a, the size of a Canadian football field, I think. Whereas in contrast, if you look at some of the poorer countries in the world, people there get by, uh, as he says, on about on less than half a hectare per person to produce everything they need and to assimilate their wastes. And this is a famous calculation. He estimates that the productive area on the earth is about 12 billion hectares, so the area where you could grow crops or harvest fish or things like that. And if you take the area per person, and here it is 12 billion hectares divided by, I know this hasn't been updated, but 7.4 billion, it's now about 7.8 billion, you get about 1.6 hectares per person. So that's sort of what you would consider as your your fair share of the productive uh, land on the planet. And you can see we're using way more than that. And so what this really means is if you want to bring up the uh, entire planet to the lifestyle of uh, the typical North American, you're going to need more land. You're going to need several more Earth-like planets, which we don't have. And so this has some implications uh, uh, for uh, the whole sustainability problem. So, by way of introduction, I'm going to, I normally play the videos in class, but what I'm going to do this time is just link you to the videos, but I just want to give you a little bit of an introduction. He talks about something called carrying capacity. So, the carrying capacity is the maximum population of a species uh, that the environment can sustain indefinitely. And in... Uh, his video, you'll see he has some fairly extreme views on sustainability. He thinks that humans are indeed an overshoot. And as I talked about, there isn't enough land for poor countries to grow to become as uh, rich as us. And he talks about the, the, the myth of perpetual growth, which I've talked about. So these are the links here to the two videos. I'll put them on uh, D2L. And I think they're about 50 minutes long each. They're definitely worth watching. You may not completely agree with them, but they're, they're uh, well, there's a lot of academics and a lot of scientists who do agree with this perspective. So that ends chapter one. Again, please do the readings and 
once you've done the readings and you've watched all the videos, try the problem sets. There's some practice problem sets with full solutions on D2L. They'll give you an idea of what kind of problems you might see on the midterm exam for chapter one. And that ends chapter one.